I am with you always until the end of the world. I got so much, so much to tell you in so little time. I got about an hour tonight, got another two hours tomorrow. But I'm going to try to give you as much as I can. We're going to learn how to move mountains now. God created us to be one like this with him. You heard that already. When we sin, we separate from God, we turn our backs and walk away. Until such time that we turn around and walk back towards God. And if there is no unforgiveness in our lives, we breach that last gap that separates God from us. And we become one like this with Him. And even though this is a beautiful thing, as most of you are experiencing now, there is one thing that is even more beautiful than this. And that is to be like this with God. When everything that is his, his peace, his joy, his love, his power flows from him into us. But in order to be like this, we need to surrender our lives into God's hands. And in order to do that, we need to trust him. We need to have faith in him. And the question for all of you now is, do you have faith? Do you? One of the things I like to do is to challenge people's assertions. I don't challenge them with an idea of undermining you or your beliefs, but with the idea of finding out just exactly where we are on this journey we're called to travel. Because it is only when we know how far we have traveled do we realize how far we have left to go? And the question is this, do you really have faith? Okay. How many of you here don't worry about a single thing in your lives? Raise your hands. You don't worry about your jobs, you don't worry about your finances, you don't worry about your health, you don't worry about your children, you don't worry about your future. If there's anyone in this church who doesn't worry about a single thing, raise your hands. All right, I see about three or four hands going up. Praise God. What about the rest of you? You worry, don't you? And when you worry, you show how much faith you have. One day Jesus told a story of a rich man who had a huge crop. Now this man should have been happy about the crop that he had, but instead of being happy, he began to worry. He said, where am I going to store my grain and my goods? And then finally he had to think about it and he said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down my old bonds and I'm going to build new ones. And in them, I'm going to store my grain and my goods and then I'm going to put my feet up and be happy for the rest of my life. God came to him that night and said, you fool, tonight you're going to die. Who are you leaving all these things for? 
And then Jesus turns to his disciples and he says to them, Therefore, I tell you, why do you worry? Do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storerooms or barn, yet God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than birds? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? I want to ask you the same question. Who of you by worrying here can add a single hour to his life? Can you? Forget about an hour. Can you add a single minute to your life? Can you? Who of right. you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? You cannot do it, right? Why can you not do it? Why can you not do it? Because God is in control of your life, right? Now, if God is in control of the most important thing about your life, which is your life itself, doesn't it stand to reason that he's in control of everything about your life? Your family, your finances, your future. So why do you worry? Consider Jesus again. Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was clothed like one of these. And if this is how God clothes the grass of the field that is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O you, of little faith? O you, of little faith. And that is the reason, my brothers and sisters, why we worry. Because we have little faith. Show me a man or a woman who does not worry about anything and I will show you a man and woman of tremendous faith. But show me a man or a woman who worries about every little thing and don't tell me how much faith they have because they have little faith. And that's a pity. That's a pity because God has some pretty amazing promises in his Bible. You know what he says? I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and the mountain will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. And then later on in John 14, 12, he tells his apostles, I tell you the truth. If anyone has faith in me, he will do what I have been doing. No, he will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. We all know the things that Jesus has done, right? What has Jesus done? He has healed the sick. He has made the blind see, the deaf hear. He has driven out demons. He has brought the dead back to life. And he says here, listen to me carefully. He's talking to the apostles, but he's not saying you guys. He's saying, if anyone has faith in me, he will do what I have been doing. No, he will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I ask you, what is greater than raising somebody from the dead? He says we can do it. What is greater than raising somebody from the dead? Let me give you a clue. Jesus brought Lazarus back from the dead, right? What happened to Lazarus? He died again. Jesus brought another little girl back from the dead. What happened to her? She died again. What is greater than bringing somebody back from the dead? Bringing them to eternal life. On one of my first missions in Canada, this was about seven years ago, I preached to a group of people just like you. And after the session was over, a woman came to me and said, my husband is at home, he's very sick. He has a problem with his throat. For one month, he has not been able to eat. For the last week, he's not been able to drink anything. He has to be fed water from a teaspoon. The doctors don't know what is wrong. We're all afraid that he is going to die. Can you please come and pray with him? 
I find it very difficult to refuse any such request. So the next morning I went to this lady's house. The man was sitting on a couch looking very weak, very frail, as you can expect from somebody who's not eaten anything in a month. Sitting across from him were his two daughters. One of them was a paraplegic, a cripple. She was sitting in a wheelchair. Sitting across from her was her elder sister who was an atheist like I had been. She had not been inside of a church in 20 years. She just did not believe that God existed. I made a little small talk and then this woman came to me and said, Brother, will you please pray over my husband? And I asked her, why? Do you believe I can heal him? And very simply, she said, yes. And I said, I'm sorry. I have no such power. All I can do is pray to the one who has the power. And if I can do that, so can any of you. So I told the girl who was sitting in the wheelchair, I said, I want you to go across to your father. I want you to put your hand on his head. And I want you to pray to our father, asking him to heal your dad. She looked at me for a long minute. She wasn't sure that I was joking or not. But then when she saw I was very serious, she rolled her wheelchair to her father, placed her hand on his head, and started to pray. Five minutes later, I went to the kitchen and I got a glass of water and I gave it to this man. And this man, who for one week had to be fed water from a teaspoon, took that glass of water and drank it all down. The next day he started eating, a week later he was fully fine. You want to say hallelujah to that, guys? That was a great miracle, yes? But another miracle took place in the house that day. The other daughter who had not been inside of her church in 20 years, started going for mass the next day, continued every day, pick up a Bible and read it all from cover to cover in three weeks, and three months later flew all the way from Canada to India to make a retreat there. That was the greater miracle. And you really want to put your hands together for that. What is greater than bringing people back from the dead? Bringing them to eternal life where they will never die again. All you need is faith as small as a mustard seed. Do you have it? We're going to learn how to have it. But before we learn how to have it, we need to understand what faith is. The Catechism of the Catholic Church in one of its first paragraphs defines faith as man's response to God. What does that mean? First, it means that you believe that God sent his only son to die for us so that we might live. All of us believe that? If we believe that, it leads us to a second response, which is what? Understanding what I told you yesterday. You understand that that should have been you hanging there on the cross. Instead, he came and he took our place and died so that we might live. I don't know how that makes you feel, but I know what it makes me feel. Determined to never do anything that put him on the cross in the first place, which means repentance. The next response is understanding the love that it took God to send his son. Imagine that you are walking along the beach with your child, your son. And in the lake next to you, you see a man drowning and he's crying for help and you recognize this man as somebody who's treated you very, very badly. Which of you sitting here would tell your child to go into the water and save that person knowing it might mean your son's death? I'm telling you, none of you would do it. Now you imagine this. That you are there in that water and you are drowning and you find God walking with his son next to you. And you cry out to him for help. Somebody that you have hurt all your life. And God says to his son, go and save him. When you understand that love, you can only respond back with love. And that is response number three. Response number four is understanding that a good God asks you to do things only for one reason, to make you happy. And his commandments are not there to take away your freedom, but to give you freedom. And response number four is obedience. And response number five is understanding and trusting 
that God is in control of everything in your life. So you surrender, letting him take the control. And one of the best metaphors, we're going to talk about that now, one of the best metaphors of surrender is walking on water. Do you know anyone who's walked on water? Jesus, you, right? You know that story? Can I tell it to you again? Because there's another man who also walked on water. Who? I told you I was going to talk about him a lot more. One day Jesus was preaching on a mountain to about 5,000 people. After talking to them, he told his apostles to go and wait for him by the lake while he said bye to everybody. I'm a lot like him. I like to say bye to everyone before they leave. When you leave here tomorrow, don't go without saying bye to me, okay? All right? All right. So by the time Jesus said bye to everybody, it was very late. He spent a little time in praying and then he came to the lake and he found the apostles already in the middle of the lake. But rather than call them towards him, he began to walk towards them on the water. Now I want you to imagine this scene, all right? It's four o'clock in the morning. There's a little bit of a storm blowing. The apostles are there in a boat and they suddenly see this figure in white coming towards them. What do they think? Ghost. Until, Peter, until Jesus says to them, hey guys, cool it. It's only me. And then Peter is always this guy who likes to open his mouth faster than his brain can get into action. He says, Jesus, that's the neat trick. I want to do it too. And Jesus says to him, come on in. The water is good. So then Peter gets out of the boat and he begins to walk on the water towards Jesus. Until suddenly he sees the wind begin to blow. And what happens to him? He begins to sink. Bluk, 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 bluk. And then he cries out, Jesus, save me. And Jesus reaches out and pulls him up and says to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? You know something? Peter is not the only one who walks on water. Every one of us sitting in this church today walks on water. When your jobs are secure, when you have enough money in your bank account, when everybody in your family has good health, forget about walking on water, you can do a break dance on water. Right? But let the wind begin to blow just a little bit. Let your jobs be threatened. Let your bank balance start to go down. Let somebody in your house start to run a temperature of 102. What happens? Bluk, 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 bluk. Jesus, save me! And there is no shame in that. There is no shame in crying out to help. But there is shame if you continue to drown because true faith it's not just walking on water when the water is calm. It is walking on water in the middle of a tempest, knowing that God is there with you and he will make sure that you don't drown. That is faith. We've got to learn how to have that faith here tonight. Do you want to know how to do it? Two lessons. Everything about our faith is easy. But for the first lesson, I need to take you to the Old Testament. How many of you have seen the Ten Commandments here, the movie? All, all of you? Most of you know this story, but I have this habit of telling people stories they already know. The Israelites were under bondage to the Egyptians. And for years they cried out to God for a deliverer until God finally heard their prayer and he caught hold of this guy called Moses and he said, go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. So Moses goes to Pharaoh and he says, I have a message to you from God. God says, let my people go. Pharaoh doesn't know Moses. He doesn't know Moses is God. He said, you and your God can get lost. So Moses goes back to his God and he says, this is what Pharaoh says. God says, oh, is that what he did? He wants to play hardball with me. Let's play hardball with him. So he sent plague after 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 plague. After plague. Ten plagues in all before Pharaoh finally gets the picture and he lets the Israelites go to freedom. 
But no sooner do they leave, Pharaoh begins to have second thoughts. He says, hey, there's nobody to make my bath water hot. There's nobody to scratch my back when it itches. We made a big mistake letting these slaves go. Let's go and get them back. So he gathers his army together and he chases after the Israelites and he finally catches up with them at the Red Sea. You all know this, right? So here you have a sandwich. You have the Red Sea on one side and Pharaoh's army on the other side. And what happens to the Israelites? Like any good Christian, they begin to panic. And they say, Moses, Moses, why did you bring out here into the desert to die? Weren't there enough graves in Egypt? And Moses says to them this, listen very carefully. Stand still. Do not be afraid. The Lord will deliver you today. Just be still. What happens next is beautifully described in Psalm 106. I'm going to read it to you. It's a condensed version. He rebuked the Red Sea and it dried up. He led them through the depths as through a desert. He saved them from the hand of the foe, from the hand of the enemy. He redeemed them. The waters covered the adversaries. Not one of them survived. Then they believed his promises and sang his praises. You've seen the Ten Commandments, right? You remember Charlton Heston as Moses? Now, I know I don't look anything like him. For one thing, he had a lot more hair than I did. But never mind that. He raised his hand. And the waters of a sea parted. And with all the Israelites, they moved through the middle to the other side. And as the enemy came behind them, the waters rolled back, killing all of them, destroying everybody. The Israelites were ecstatic. They were delighted with the victory they had received. So they jumped up and down. They sang till they were blue in their faces. They cried hallelujah much louder than any of you possibly could. They celebrated as they should. But there is one small thing wrong with this picture. There is one very small thing wrong with this picture. Does anybody know what it is? They sang his praises on the wrong side of the river. It is very easy to praise God when victory has been won. It is very easy to praise God when you finally got the job that you've been hunting for for months. It is very easy to praise God when your child who's been running a temperature of 104 is okay. It is very easy to praise God then. What about before? Why didn't the Israelites praise God before they crossed the river? Because they didn't believe that God could save them. Did God expect them to have blind faith? Oh, God knows how weak we are. But he showed them that he was with them. He kept them safe through ten plagues. He had the most powerful man in the world at that time open the gates of the city and give them freedom. Through their march in the desert, he appeared before them as a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire during the night. He showed them that he was with them. Yet when push came to shove, they didn't believe that he could save them. Now I'm going to tell you something so amazing you won't believe it. After they reached the other side, you want to know what the very next line in Psalm 106 says? Verse 13, but they soon forgot what he had done. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? But they soon forgot what he had done. God has just worked one of the greatest miracles in the sight of man. He has parted the waters of an entire sea and given a nation freedom. And they soon forgot what he had done. Despite the fact that God is still working miracles in their lives. He kept their clothes intact, their health intact, their footwear intact. When they were thirsty, he had water come out from a rock. When they were hungry, he had food come down from heaven. 
But they soon forgot what he had done. Can you believe it? Yes, you can believe it. You know why? Because this is your story. This is your story. That God does things in your lives time and time and time and time again. But you don't remember. Which brings me to the first lesson. All you need to do is remember the things that God has done in your life in the past. You know, when I was released from jail, I was broke. I was broke when I went into jail. When I came out, I was broker, if that is possible. And there were bills to be paid. I didn't have a job. I didn't have any money. My wife had a good job, but most of her money was tied up in loans. She used to bring home about 2,000 dirhams a month. And among the many bills that had to be paid, one bill was to our landlord. You know, in, in the UAE, how it works, you give them four checks at intervals of three months. And I remember the first check was due on the 1st of January, and we didn't have enough money to cover it. And I began to get really anxious because, as you know, if you bounce a check here, they put you in jail. And just come out from jail, I had no particular desire to go back. Right? So, I prayed. You know, I had this new faith. And I went to my little prayer room. And I sat there in front of God about a week before this check was due. And I said, God, I really need some help here. I don't have enough money to cover the rent. Can you please help me? And I heard him say, be still. So be still. Yes, be still. You're going to take care of the rent? I will. Be still. So I was still for all of 24 hours, and there's no sign of any money coming. So I began to get nervous again. So I go back to my prayer room and say, God, about that money, be still. All right, okay. I was still again for another 24 hours, and I said, this is stupid. So I went to a friend, borrowed some money, and put it in the bank and cleared the check. And I heard God say to me, I told you to be still, Anil. Why couldn't you be still? All right, Lord, next time, next time I will be still, hoping that it won't come to it. But with God, there's no messing around, right? If he wants to do something in your life, he's going to make sure that he does it. Three months later, it's the same story, right? There's a check due. I don't have enough funds to cover it. And this countdown begins, you know. And I go to God and God's still saying the same thing, be still. So I remember this time I said I'm going to be still. Seven, six, five, God, be still. Four, nothing. I go to a friend, borrow some money, put it in the bank. Anil, when are you going to learn to trust me? Okay, Lord, okay. Next time, next time, even if I have to go to jail, I'll go to jail, I'll evangelize the prisoners there, but I'm not going to borrow any money. And this time I'm determined not to borrow any money, but I'm hoping in my heart it won't come to that. Right? But I told you, with God, there's no messing around. Three months later, it's the same story. There is a check due, not enough funds, and the countdown begins. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Nothing. Nothing. Not a dirham from anywhere. The next morning, one hour before the banks are to open, there is a man standing at my doorstep. Exactly the amount of money I need to pay my rent. It was money that I lent him three years ago, and suddenly that morning he was inspired to return it to me. That is the last time in my life I have ever asked anyone for anything. I travel around the world today, every continent, country to country on an empty wallet, knowing that if I need a hundred dollars tomorrow, or $1,000 tomorrow, or $100,000 tomorrow, I will have it today. And how do I know it? Because I'm special. I'm special? Say yes. yes. Because I remember 
that at the one time in my life when I needed money and there was no hope of getting it from anywhere, not only did God give it to me, he had it hand delivered to my doorstep. And if he could do that once, he can do it again. And he has done it again and again and again. Am I special? Say yes. So are you. So are you. So are you. Look into your lives, my brothers and my sisters, and see the number of times when God has done something for you. Do you remember the last time you needed a job? You got a job, didn't you? How did you get it? Because you were lucky? No such thing. Do you remember the last time somebody was sick in your house? They became well, right? How did they become well? Because your doctor was good? Possibly, but God was behind them. Look at the time when you last had a problem that was so insurmountable, but the problem disappeared, right? God has been doing these miracles in your lives time and time and time again. So the next time you have a problem, all you need to do is remember what God did for you once before and stand still or let go. There was a man who was once climbing up a mountain. It was a steep mountain. And he suddenly fell. He kind of slipped and he fell. And he fell almost to a certain death except to his good fortune there was a branch sticking out of the mountain and he landed on the branch. He clung on to that branch for dear life and he looked down and he saw sharp, jagged rocks at the bottom. And he knew if he let go of the branch broke, he was falling to a certain death. So what did he do? Like any good Christian, he began to panic and he began to say, help, help, is anybody up there? Until finally he heard this voice. This is God. I don't know why God always has to talk in that voice, but never mind. And he said, thank you, Lord. You're there. Save me, Lord. Help me, Lord. And he heard God say, let go. Huh? You know, you heard me. Let go. He looks down. Nothing has changed. The rocks are still the same. As sharp, sharper than ever before. And he looks up. Are you sure? I am sure. Let go. He looks down. He looks up. He looks down. He looks up. He looks down. He looks up again. Is anybody else up there? <laughs> he, he, he wanted maybe a, a you know, helicopter to come, butu, 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 drop a ladder and, you know, or maybe the policeman to come or, or, you know. God's asking him to let go. No. Why are you laughing? Why are you laughing? This story is also about you. Isn't it? You're stuck there in a problem. You have this great difficulty in your lives. And God says, let go. No, is anybody up there? Fire brigade, please. Policeman, please. Brother O'Neill, please. He will pray for me and everything will be okay. Come on. Come on. Imagine you're five years old. I know some of you are very big, but I'm sure if you try hard enough, you can imagine what it's like to be five years old. You're five years old. And you're on the first floor balcony of your building, and your building is on fire. Your father comes along, and he's this thin, weak, skinny man. You know, I'm trying to see if there are any thin, weak, skinny men in this church, but there don't seem to be any. <laughs> so anyway, this thin, weak, skinny man comes to you and says to you, my child, jump. I am telling you there's not a single person in this room who would not jump. Right? Right? Why? Because you know that that man down there, skinny though he might be, weak though he might be, frail though he might be, will not 
let you fall to your death. Right? Say yes. But him, creator of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen, he tells you to jump and you can't do it. Which brings me to the second lesson. Remember that he is your father. He is your father. And he loves you very much. And do you think he's really going to let you fall to your death? I mean, come on. Seriously. And that is all there is to growing in faith. We see miracles taking place in a ministry daily. You can see the testimonies online. People being healed of diseases and illnesses where the doctors have given up on them. Not a monthly thing, not a yearly thing, day after day after day. People in financial difficulties, everything is suddenly eased up. Why? Because we help people understand what I have helped you understand here. That God is faithful. That He's there with us. That He's not going to let anything happen to us. The only thing is we need to be in a relationship with Him. One of my most favorite verses in the Bible is Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Listen to this. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Let me put that in plain language. What this verse says, if you need anything, you go to God, you tell Him what you need, you thank Him, and then you go away in peace. Sounds too simplistic to you, right? But imagine this. I have a daughter at home, and once in a way she will come to me and say, Dad, I have a picnic next week. I need to take some money for the picnic. And I say, okay, baby. And she gives me a tight hug, says, thank you, Daddy. I love you very much, and goes and plays. Why? I have not given her the money. Why does she do that? Because she trusts me. She knows that I am a father, and on the day when she needs to take the money to school or a day before, she will have it, right? It is the same thing with us and God. That we need to go to Him with the same trust, the same faith. But there is one little catch here. We need to be in a relationship with Him. Now my daughter and me are in a fabulous relationship. But I got a son too. And he's a little over a teenager. But you know what sons are like. Once in a while he'll come to me. And he said, Dad, I need a new guitar. And I'll say, I'll think about it, son. <laughs> you know, why? Because I love him. I love him like crazy. I love him as much as I love my daughter. But he doesn't quite have the same relationship with me that my daughter has. My daughter, I'll give something instantly because I know her motivations and her heart and everything is right. But my son and I sometimes have a little friction and I probably will get him the new guitar, but I'll make him sweat for it a little bit. It's the same thing with us and God. God loves us. If you are in a good relationship with him, if you are in a relation that I just described like that, I'm telling you, there is nothing he will not deny you. Nothing. Nothing. And it's what he says. If you remain in me and my word remains in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. What a promise. John 14, 7, in case you want to read that up. If you remain in me and let my word remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. I am in him, and his word is in me. And I'm going to ask him for something very special here today. I'm going to ask that he empowers all of you. That tomorrow when you come here, it will be like a new Pentecost. That just like there were tongues of fire 2,000 years ago, there are going to be tongues of fire here. He's going to set us on fire, a fire that is going to blaze and set the entire world alight. That is my prayer, and I believe he's going to answer it. I believe. And you know what? 
You come here tomorrow and you will see that prayer being answered. But for now, I need to finish what I started here today. Surrender. One of the problems we have is we don't truly surrender to God. And since I'm on the subject of surrender, I want to talk about something a little sensitive. And the reason I want to talk about this is because nobody ever does. I want to talk about death. It is hard to lose people whom we love. When we love somebody dearly and they die, it causes us a lot of pain. I know that. We wouldn't love very much if it didn't cause us pain. But many of us are unable to let go. And that will cause us a lot of distress. Now I want to talk about something that will make it easier to understand death a little more. Let us imagine that I give you a book to read. You come over to my house next week and I give a book to you to read. You take the book home and you don't return it to me either because you've forgotten or I've forgotten. I go away to a foreign country for about five years. The book's with you. After five years, I come and I meet you and I say, hey, you remember that book I lent you? Can I have it back? Can you say, no, this book belongs to me? Can you? No, because the book belongs to me. And one of the things we need to understand truly is that each and every one of us who's sitting here and everything we own belongs to God, not to us. He lets us have people in our lives for a little while. Some people, eight years, 100 years, we're blessed. Some people less. Some people just a few months. But just because we've had someone with us for 50 years, that person isn't ours. It still remains God's. And I think if we understand this, we truly understand this, there will be a lot of healing in our hearts. I want there to be complete healing here today. I want there to be complete surrender. And one of the things I want us to do when we surrender is to give everything we have to God, including the people in our lives. Can you do that? Many of us have addictions over here. I want us to give those addictions to God today. Two months after my conversion, I went for a retreat to South India. God had already worked a lot of things in my life. For instance, I used to drink a lot. I used to drink a bottle a day and he took that away. But I still had a habit of smoking. And a lot of people told me that if I went to this retreat, God would take away this habit too. And I said, well, if that happens, well and good, but I was going prepared. I had five cartons of Benson and Hedges in my backpack. Why five cartons? Because I used to smoke like a chimney. I used to smoke something like 60, 70 cigarettes a day. All right, not a week, in a day. So I went to this retreat center, and the first thing I saw outside was smoking strictly prohibited. Right? Now, I changed a lot, but I still hadn't changed that much. I was still very arrogant. I said, I'm not listening to that rule walked inside. Now, once you enter this retreat place, you were locked in. Five days, you couldn't get out. So I was there in that place for five days, but I couldn't care. Not allowed to smoke. I have five cartons with me. We went. My wife was with me. We went and registered for the retreat. We had the first session in the morning. We had a 15-minute break. I remember running up to my room and smoking five cigarettes, one after another, you know, because I didn't know when I'd get the next cigarette. I came down. And when I came down, one of the preachers, almost in passing, spoke about how sacred life was and how it was a sin to take your life. And it struck me then that when you smoke, just like when you drink or do drugs, it's killing oneself. I'm not asking you, okay, this is what I thought, all right? Let's get that clear. But the moment I discovered something was a sin, I no longer wanted to have anything more to do with it. So I said, Lord, I want to quit smoking, but I don't know how. I agonized about it, one hour, two hours, and I finally heard Jesus whisper in my ear, Anil, give it up. I said, Lord, I want to give it up, but I don't know how to give it up. He said, just give it to me. That evening, they had a session called Surrender, kind of similar to what I've spoken about here today. They got a bucket, and they kept it out there. 
And the priest said, if anyone has a habit or an addiction or a weakness or a sacrifice they wanted to make to God, to write it on a piece of paper and to put it in that bucket. I said, this is my cue, except I'm not going to write anything on a piece of paper. I'm going to get the cigarettes from my room and I'm going to throw it in there. So I get up and I walk to my room. I am not alone. I have somebody with me. You know who? <laughs> what are you doing? Are you mad? You're going to be locked in here for five days. You don't want to smoke. Don't smoke. But keep the cigarettes with you just in case. I said, I'm not listening to you. And I continued walking. I said, okay, okay. You want to throw them out? Fine, throw them out. But you know, don't, give, don't just junk them. Sell them to somebody. You're in India. They'll pay a fortune for foreign cigarettes. I'm not listening to you, I said, and I continued walking. I finally reached this room and I spent five minutes trying to open the lock before I realized I'm on the wrong floor. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I finally reach my room, I reach my floor, I go there, take the cartons of cigarettes, the loose packets that are lying around, I bring them down, I throw them into the bucket, and guess what? My addiction is gone. There is no cold turkey, there is no craving for a cigarette. <laughs> A habit I thought I could never get rid of was taken away just by my decision to give it to God. Now there's one thing, when you give something to God, you need to give it. You know, many of us, many of us do this. Take this. Go on, take it. Take it. He's not taking it. Please take it. He's still not taking it. Please take it. He's not taking it. Why isn't he taking it? Why? Because I'm not giving it to him. And this is what we do with God too. Take my money. Take my life. Take my wife. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> you know. But we're clutching it. We're clinging on to it. How can God take it? He's too much of a gentleman to reach out and snatch it from our hands. When we give it to God, we need to give it to Him, take it, and let go. Now I am free. And I want you to look at me one more time. I am the freest man on this planet. Because even though I have everything, I don't really have anything. Because everything I have belongs to God. My family, my finances, everything is His. And I really think He does a better job of looking after everything than I possibly could. Now, if you were to take my wife away, I would mourn her because I love her very much. But I would understand that she belongs to God. If I were to lose everything in my house, the man who stands before you tomorrow would be the same man who stands before you today. Because even though I have everything, I have even a PS3, you know, <laughs> but it means nothing to me. It's just stuff that is there. And this is what I want us to do here today. I want us to give everything to God. And understand the more you give of yourself, the more you empty yourself. And the more you empty yourself, the more he can fill you with himself and the stuff that he wants us to have. And tomorrow I'm telling you guys, repentance, go for a good confession if you haven't already. Spend a little more time tonight forgiving everyone in your life who has hurt you and continue to surrender everything you can into his hands. And tomorrow when you come here, I am telling you, I've seen this time and time again everywhere I have preached. You come here tomorrow and you will find your lives just changed beyond belief.